Hey guys, Sean here from The Sean Tabbit Show. Hope you are having a fantastic day. I have been combing through my electronic archives and I came across a conversation that I had back in April of 2018. I actually recorded a bit of audio with Pam Moore. Pam was Corey Tenboom's traveling assistant towards the end of her life. And after we recorded that audio snippet, I was able to spend a few minutes talking with Pam and just getting some context for her life as she traveled with Corey, as she ministered with Corey, and what it was like to be a part of the last few years of Corey's life. And I've never shared this with anybody publicly, and I thought you all might really enjoy getting a chance to listen to this conversation. Honestly, it felt like I was touching a part of church history. I hope you enjoy it. I was just curious, since I've never encountered you before, what was your connection to Corey and the Sherrills? Like, how did you get connected to them? I just, I've never heard that story. Let me see, how can I cut it down so it's interesting and everything is true about it. How I came to know Tunter Cory, is that one of the things you'd like to know? Yeah, I'm personally mm-hmm. curious as somebody yeah, who's that's right. read the no, I, place I, and I understand that, yeah, of course. Cory needed a travel companion and the companion she'd had for about nine years was going to marry an American. So they asked me if I would go and help Tante Cory. I didn't see how I would be very good at being a, a helper to Tante Cory, but I said yes, because she obviously needed somebody. She was in her 80s. And so big time together of a lot of travel, a lot of uh, anointed talking, a lot of writing. Oh, how she loved writing, getting the word of, out, you know. I know you know that Christian Literature Crusade still has some of her books, I think probably quite a few. So we worked together, and once I remember that I was wearing a kind of cape, it was cold, and Tonta Corey told me that she'd rather I didn't wear that cape because it reminded her of the Nazis. You know, I hadn't thought of that. It was just, The Nazis wore capes. But, of course, that that kind of thing didn't happen very often. She just made a tremendous number of visits and talking, and it was really too much for me, but she did marvelously. Then she had a stroke. I think you probably know that she had a stroke which did a lot of damage to the left side of her brain. So I wrote a book called The Five Silent Years of Corrie ten Boom which is so much hoped we can bring back into print. It was five years of nursing. I had lots of good helpers. As her throat became more and more weak, we worked out a way to hold her head and to put certain foods in a blender and then feed them into her mouth so that she wouldn't lose all her energy. But it was certainly a very difficult time and a very difficult death. You know, people, I'm sure, wonder, you know, why would it happen to her? But then that's a big theological question. (laughs) Suffering is a big theological question. And it didn't escape her, but she always trusted the Lord. Where were some of the places you traveled with, Corey? Did you, were you in Europe or in the United States? Or where were some of the places you acted as her companion? I think the first time I traveled with her was when Billy Graham was in Sweden and wanted her to be part of a, not a big part, but she was there for one of his campaigns. And she didn't really spend a lot of time in the Netherlands. It was hard for her in the Netherlands. And I don't really have the right wording to say why, except that I think (laughs) she thought that Dutch people, it was rather difficult for them. You know, they wondered who was this woman? Where did she come from? But she did have some appointments in the Netherlands, of course, and people always wanted her to talk. But then came the wider opportunity she had to speak in all over the place. I remember the first time we went together, we were going to the east coast of the United States. I forget which town it was now. And then she went into Canada and then came down the other side and I remember thinking, where did she get this energy from? How am I going to be able to keep pace with her? And that's how it really, you know, was in a sense. But she had a great sense of humor. This may be going off 
on to another tangent, but I, I always think it's rather funny. You've not heard of this because I'm sure you're too young and it was too long ago. But in the north of California, there's a big burial place. And I think it contains the remains of many of the film stars and important people up there. But Jimmy Collier, who was a brilliant director and, and with whom Corey got on very well, she had written four or five books and she wanted them to be filmed. And she used to say, so that they can travel and I don't have to. She was getting older, you see, and she was getting too tired and old to travel. So the day came when we went up to this graveyard area and we had all the microphones and those grips and things and the lights and lots of people standing around. And then um, Corey was, she liked Spurgeon. You've heard of the preacher Spurgeon. She was using the words of Spurgeon, which are something like this. Oh, to have one's soul under heavenly cultivation, no wilderness but a garden of the Lord. And then she would take that further. So there we were up in this lovely place with rose bushes and other flowers and getting all this material ready. And Corrie was not in any way abashed. She liked communication. So... We were standing there with all this equipment, getting ready for the next scene, when a bus came, and it was a dusty day, and this bus was kicking up quite a lot of dust. And when it stopped, several middle-aged ladies came rather heavily out of the bus and made their way towards Corey, who had never heard of her, of course, and she didn't know about Corey. And this lady, they was coming out of the bus fanning their faces and trying to get the dust out of their throats, said, oh, I, how on earth do you live here? I just don't understand how people can live here. And Corey said, people don't live here. They are all dead here. <laughs> <laughs> so I always liked that. And that she, she's very determined and right and had funny things sometimes, such as I've just told you. I appreciate just at a personal level, thank you for sharing a little bit of the extra context of your personal experiences. That's a real blessing for me. Thank you so much for that, Pam. Uh, I'm so glad you called, Sean. Hope it helps you to have those words. <laughs>